I'm going to be discussing your tank discharge pre-lab lecture. And uh, for this uh, lab, you're going to be actually working on compressible flows, and more specifically, uh, with choked flow. So I'll be going over the theory behind the lab, uh, exactly what you'll need to do for your write-up, and uh, what derivations will be necessary to uh, complete the theoretical evaluation and analysis. So on this first board here, we have a relationship for the mass flow rate for choked flow, um, which you can see is negative CD times uh, 0.6847 times the stagnation pressure times A star, all divided by R times T uh, to the one half, where R is your gas constant and T naught is your stagnation temperature. And uh, CD is a constant that was developed empirically for, uh, for different orifice sizes. And for what we're using for this experiment, we're, uh, 0.6 should work for, for our needs. So compressible flow is in, uh, is in the book. So if you have specific questions on what some of these variables mean, you can look them up and uh, get more information on them. Moving on to the next board. Um, the purpose of this lab is to run the experiment with the tank. We'll be letting pressurized air out of small orifices and from there we'll be trying to model that process. So we have two different um, processes that we want to use to try to match our experimental data. So the first one here is an isothermal process which assumes that we have constant temperature inside the tank and the second is an isentropic process which assumes that we have adiabatic and reversible conditions and that there's constant entropy. So the first thing I'd like to go over is the derivation for the isothermal process. Um, what we'll have you do is uh, work out these derivations for each process uh, in the lab report so that you could understand exactly where this is coming from and that you can, you can develop this relationship for pressure that you'll then be plotting. So in the isothermal case, we start with the ideal gas law uh, where we have PV equals MRT and rearranging that we can have that the mass is equal to pressure times volume over the gas constant times temperature. So what we want to look at here is we want to equate this to the mass flow rate that we found earlier for choked flow. So in order to do that we want to take the derivative of the equation we just simplified. So we have dm over dt is equal to the volume over the gas constant times the change in pressure over temperature over time. Now, in the isothermal case, as I mentioned, the temperature is constant. So that's not going to be changing. So we can pull it out um, of the operator there. So looking at that equation and also equation two for the mass flow rate for choked flow, uh, what we'd like to do now is set those two equal to each other and then solve for the stagnation pressure in terms of time. So what that would allow us to do then is use the pressure data that you get from the experiment and uh, basically plug those data points in for the stagnation pressure at a given time, which is also data that you'll be getting from the experiment. So moving on, uh, first setting them equal to each other, we have here that uh, this is just the expression from above with the temperature moved out of the operator there. So we now have the volume over the gas constant times the temperature times the change in pressure over time is equal to the expression that we have for the choked, uh, the mass flow rate for the choked flow. So the first thing we want to do to rearrange these is to move this stuff over to the other side and to isolate the pressure term by moving that to the other side. So in order, that allows us to then get it into a form where we can integrate and we can solve for the pressure. So just to give you an idea of where we're going with this. Um, so the next part here is actually just the result of making those, diff those changes. And you end up with 1 over the pressure times DDT of the pressure equals the <laughs> minus CD 0.6847 A star and then you find that when you move the gas constant and temperature to the other side you get a factor that cancels out and that leaves you with R times T to the one half in the top of the equation. And the next step would be to move the DT to the other side so we can then integrate both sides and getting to integrating 
we see here that uh, if we integrate this side, we can get the ln of uh, the pressure plus some constant from integration. And on the other side, we get this whole term times time plus another constant of integration. Now, just for simplification purposes, I, I made another constant, which I'm calling C3, which is just a combination of the other two constants. So you don't have to keep track of two things. You just want to solve for one. Um, so then, what do, what do we know about the system? How can we solve for that constant? We know that at time t, our pressure is at an initial pressure, which we'll get from the data. So plugging that information in, we then have that the initial pressure, the ln of the initial pressure, is equal to 0 when you plug in 0 for t, plus the constant. So the integration constant is equal to the ln of the initial pressure. So plugging that back in and rearranging, you end up with the ln of the pressure minus ln of the initial pressure is equal to uh, just ln of the pressure divided by the initial pressure, which on the other side of the equation, you still just have the um, mass flow rate for choked flow that we, well, it's not exactly the mass flow rate anymore, but the uh, manipulation that we did earlier, you have that same term times time. So after you uh, raise each, uh, by E, you, you can eliminate the ln on the other side and this, the rest of it's really simple and you just end up with uh, the pressure is equal to the initial pressure times E to the power of all of the other things times T. <laughs> so that's the relationship that you'll use for the isothermal condition for plotting your pressure over time. Now, uh, again, isothermal, your temperature over time isn't going to change. So you'll have a constant temperature throughout that process. Um, moving on to the isentropic process, if we were to model this as an isentropic process, we start off with a lot of the same things here. Uh, you'll recognize this equation was the same as equation one that we saw before, and equation three is what we had as equation two before. The only difference here is that now our temperature is changing. So we have a relationship that relates the temperature to the pressure. And what that's used for is you'll be plugging this, this uh, stagnation temperature into these two places where you have stagnation temperature. So it really it complicates the expression, but you use generally the same process, and from there you end up with a relationship that looks like this. Um, and note here that gamma is the same as K. It's kind of used in, uh, as both, but it, so just so you don't get confused, it's the same thing. And for air, that value is 1.4. So after you derive this relationship, which will be one of the things that we're looking for in your lab report is this derivation, um, you'll then be able to plot the isentropic process uh, along with your experimental data. So when you finally uh, have the processes evaluated, you have the relationships ready, and you start to plot your data, you may have experimental data that looks similar to this, and one of your uh, theoretical processes may look something like this. So the first thing we want to look at is which process better models what we see in the experiment. So before, um, just with the constant of 1.4 for air, we want to see, okay, well, what makes more sense? Uh, you'll be looking at pressure, and you'll also be looking at temperature over time. So you'll be looking at both of those and comparing them to what you saw in both theoretical processes. Uh, another thing to consider is that in the lab report, we also ask that you, you change uh, the K or gamma value to see if there's one that would make your curve better fit what you've seen uh, in the experiment. Or, I'm sorry, make your experimental data better fit what you would expect theoretically. So basically, uh, you can move this curve. So, well, you'd be moving the theoretical curve to see if it matches your experimental better. So remember that the purpose of the experiment is to see if we can come up with a, a process that will model what we're seeing in the, in the experiment. So what we could do then is if you look back at the expression that you have for the isentropic process, you have this gamma throughout this whole equation. Um, so when you put this into an Excel spreadsheet, you can have a cell that represents gamma, and when you change that cell, you can, you can see exactly how your curve will change and what better matches what you've seen in the experiment. And uh, as far as your report requirements, uh, like I said, the first one that you would need to look at is your pressure relationship over time for your experimental data, your isentropic case, and your isothermal case. 
And then uh, you'll also need to plot your temperature relationship over time for those three conditions. And the other plot that we're looking for is to see the how your uh, theoretical values change once you change your K. And, and you need to find what's, what is the best K or gamma in this case uh, that would match the experimental values. What would be the best model of our system? And let's see. That should sum it up. Uh, if you have any questions about the derivation, it would be very beneficial for you to do this before you go to your lab. Um, when you get to your lab, your TA can help you with the derivation, so that's a big help um, for students who are having difficulties. It does get tricky, but you have to think back to your calculus classes, and uh, no one really likes that, but it, uh, it's, it's not that bad. You guys can figure it out. So again, have any questions, talk to your TA or see Dr. Abbott, and that concludes the pre-lab for the tank discharge lab. discharge apparatus for the tank discharge lab. Um, I'd like to show you how to run the apparatus and how you'll be getting your data. Um, the first thing that you need to do for this lab is that you need to pressurize this blue tank over here. This tank is going to hold compressed air and then you'll be opening a valve that will allow that compressed air to go into the main tank which is where you'll be measuring the air. So in order to pressurize this tank you have to turn a little red switch that is up on top of the tank. Um, I'll show you in a minute what, what it'll sound like, but we already have it pre-pressurized so that we can show you the experiment. And the pump is pretty loud, so you won't be able to hear me over it. So once you turn the red switch on, you can either let the tank get pressurized, and then after this tank reaches a certain pressure, which you can read off of the dial up here, uh, then you can open a blue handled valve in the back that will allow that air to go into the main tank. Or you can just keep this valve open while you're pressurizing uh, the tank and it will actually just pressurize the other tank. So there's those two ways you can do it. Uh, either way is fine. Just make sure that when you pressurize this tank you don't exceed 700 kilopascals. So I'll turn it on just so you can see what it's like. Uh, turn on the red switch here. pressure in the main tank is down to zero, it'll probably take maybe five minutes or so to get it back up to the uh, desired pressure. So now we're assuming you have this tank pressurized, you've already put the air into your main tank, which is the gray one, and that you already have your pressure in this tank up to 50 psig, which you can read off of the gauge here. So once you have your tank pressurized, you're going to need to start uh, preparing so that you can record your data. Now we have a pressure transducer and a thermocouple that are attached to the tank that are recording the pressure and temperature inside the tank over a course of time. So what we need to do is make sure that all of our devices are turned on so that we can get the proper readings. So first we have our power supply over here. Just flip the power switch and make sure that you're reading 5 volts. And after you have your power supply turned on, you need to make sure that your data acquisition device is turned on, which is located by the PC tower. And now that we have those turned on, we can open up the LabVIEW VI, which is an icon in the center of the screen, which says Tank Discharge. So at this point, you have all of your data acquisition devices, your power supply, your tank is pressurized, everything is set up. So the next part is to release the air through a small orifice um, from a plate that is attached to the end here. Now there are three different plates, and I'll, I'll show you what to do with those in a minute. But first, what I'd like to do is I'll run the VI, I'll open the valve, and then you can get an idea of what will happen when you run your experiment. So in order to run the VI, just hit the, the go arrow at the top here. Okay, now you can see that there's there's two plots that are starting, which that's going to be your initial press pressure and temperature inside the tank. 
And now I'm going to open the valve here. I'm going to try. It's, it's very hard to open it, so just now I might want to have a strong person do this one. Um, from the VI, your pressure and temperature are changing inside the tank as the air is expelled. And what you'll do is you'll leave it open until all of your air has exited. So your curve will, will be different from what you're seeing here since I stopped it at that point. So once all of your air has, been, has gone out and you have the plots that you need, you can then hit quit. And it will prompt you to save your file. So in this case, you can just type a name uh, that your group will remember for which orifice size you're using. And if you save it as a .xls file, it will automatically open with Excel when you save it and try to open it again at home. And I'm going to save it to desktop. Feel free to make a folder for your group to keep everything organized to make sure that you get the right, the right data. So now if I go to the desktop, here's test one, and it opens as an Excel file and it gives you the time, your pressure, uh, the standard deviation of pressure, temperature, standard deviation of temperature. Now you do not need the standard deviation columns of data, you'll just be using the pressure and the temperature columns and the time uh, to produce your plot. So after you finish it with one orifice size, you will then need to remove the plate that you just used and replace it with a different plate with an orifice of a different size. The sizes are on here. Uh, it would be good to measure these to make sure to see how accurate it is and keep track of your uncertainty. And in order to take this off, you're going to need these two. And just remove them. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to take them all off now, but once you take it off, just hang on to the hardware here. And when you put a new plate on, the way that you need to tighten these, these uh, nuts is, well, actually, when you screw the bolts in, the first thing you need to be careful of is that you're not cross-threading. If you cross-thread, it actually will damage the, the bolt, and sometimes what happens is they just shear off. And obviously, that's not a good thing. So be very careful that you're not cross-threading when you screw these in. And when you tighten them, tighten it as if you were uh, changing a tire. So you start here, then you go across, then you go up here, and then just do it across so that you're evenly tightening the whole thing. And when you tighten them, try not to tighten too much because these plates will tend to bend, and then you get leakages on the side, which don't affect your results. So just be careful. If you have questions, you can ask your TA. Um, once you have a new plate on, make sure that your valve is closed and then go through the process of repressurizing your tank, but get back up to 50 PSIG, and then run the experiment again. And you'll run it three times with three different orifice sizes. And that is it for the paint discharge lab.